Thanks, everyone. And we're going to now transition to our last use case, which is uh, Jasmine Mullican from the Stanford University Press. Um, Hello, um, I'm Jasmine from Stanford University Press, and um, I want to show a use case that we've been working on. Um, let me share my screen here. Oops, <laughs> present. Okay, just want to confirm that everyone can see what's on the screen. Looks yep. good. All right, great. Um, and while that's working, let me move my notes. Okay. Um, so Stanford University Press uh, is working right now um, on a Mellon funded initiative, um, which has been going on since 2016 and is um, set to continue um, progressing until 2022. Um, it's a program for the University Press to publish open access web-based interactive publications. And these publications, um, the closest analog, I guess you could say, is just a website. Um, they exist online. Um, anyone with the URL can, can navigate to those publications um, and then they can, they can interact with them. Um, there's no print corollary, basically. They use all of the affordances of the web to present something that couldn't actually be formatted in a traditional print book. Um, so they rely on those interactions to help make the scholarly arguments that they make. These publications are platform agnostic, um, so we don't require authors um, who are writing these digital monographs to use a specific platform. Um, so there are some other uh, presses who are, um, who are embarking on similar programs and um, they are creating, um, for instance, if you've heard of the Fulcrum platform or Manifold um, from University of Minnesota, um, University of Michigan press, presses, they're both working on similar um, initiatives, fund, also funded by Mellon, but they are, they're doing so with a kind of um, a dictated platform that they are helping to build. Uh, so these publications are using like static uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, any custom built applications that the authors and their developers have deemed um, useful for the presentation of the arguments that, that they're making. Um, we have so far six open access publications to date. Um, they range from uh, custom built platforms um, to actually three of them are using the scalar platform which was developed um, by UCS, uh, I'm sorry, University of Southern California's um, ANVC program. Um, so a lot of digital scholars are working in that platform right now. It's also um, open source and uh, the fact that three of them, three of our publications actually share that platform helps somewhat with the preservation of the work that we're publishing in that uh, if something scales, if something, if we can do something in that platform, then we can, I mean, if we can preserve one publication in that platform, then we can possibly apply those practices to preserving the other publications in that platform. Um, so, the uh, the preservation pathways that we've had to start looking at for these types of publications include um, simply depositing all of the components that live on the server into the Stanford Digital Repository so that we have copies of them um, and they are preserved, the bits are essentially pres preserved. Um, the issue with that is that they're, those that content is kind of taken out of its context um, and so while researchers can access, like say a specific HTML file or a specific image, um, they can't see all of those parts playing in the context together in which they were published. 
Um, so we're also exploring another preservation pathway, which is web archiving. Um, and uh, we're working with Ilya Kramer um, on some custom uh, web archiving work. And um, I'm hoping I can turn this presentation over to him at the very end to talk a little bit about what he's doing. Um, and then the other uh, pathway we're exploring, of course, is emulation. So um, I want to go into a little bit what these, uh, what this one publication looks like that that we're focusing on. Um, these are the six publications I mentioned before. Um, so we're going to focus on filming revolution. So this is the first publication that I have um, plugged into easy to start playing with. Um, it wasn't the first publication that we released from the press, but it is one that is very visually interesting and dynamic. Um, and one that I felt like because it was custom built could uh, benefit from testing in this environment. So um, the we chose Filming Revolution for this project. Um, and this is essentially the home page or what we call the cover page. Um, and we have one of these cover pages for each of the publications. They live separately from the full publication itself um, in a separate location on the server, just so that the cover page is isolated from any decay that might happen in the publication itself. Um, it's a static HTML, CSS, um, so it's easily updatable. Um, its primary update would probably be the redirection of that enter button um, so that preserved uh, versions could um, replace essentially the live web version um, as the project starts to decay. So what is this publication? Um, well, this is, hopefully this begins playing, yes. So this is a 2018 publication. Um, and the key there with the idea that it's a publication is that its, um, its state is fixed. So there are no updates to the project once it is published. So um, after 2018, um, there was no update to the backend code. There was no update to any of the content. It exists as it was released the day it was published. Um, this project is a pivotal contribution to scholarly communication um, surrounding the 2011 Egyptian revolution and its aftermath. It's essentially a project that um, wh where the author has interviewed um, several filmmakers in Egypt um, and asked them kind of what they, um, how they saw film um, impacting or responding to the events in Egypt. Uh, it is unique in its format in that it actually uses video to make an argument about video. Um, and it can use uh, visual pathways to show the multilinear network of agents involved in, the, in, that, in those films. So it's able to capture the multilinearity of complex historical events and a culture's reaction to them. Uh, let's see. So the operating system requirements um, for this project would essentially be a server stack. Um, and hopefully that would be applicable to all of the publications that are also hosted on that same server. So why, oops, I should also mention um, that it's important to preserve this type of content because um, obviously the content itself, um, future scholarly publications will need to be able to cite this project um, and archival footage of the filmmakers who experienced the revolution, um, this, these videos that, um, that populate the site, there are over 400 videos in the site, um, should also be preserved for the scholarly record. And then in terms of the context, um, this is essentially an example of a 2018 scholarly digital publication. So it's valuable to both um, the field of study um, but also to digital humanities scholarship. Um, there's the, the aspect of bibliographic and textual studies where um, it's, it's important to understand like what operating systems, what tools, what technologies scholars were using to make their scholarly arguments during this period. Um, and also, as I mentioned, there are, uh, there are other presses generating and uh, publishing this type of content now. Um, and even though while it's still pretty innovative and not widely 
um, adopted <laughs> format by a lot of uh, publishers. It's something that, um, since Mellon is funding it, um, it's something that hopefully will be increasing like in the next decade or so. So all of this is hard, of course, um, because it's difficult to preserve uh, web content. Um, so in general, we are trying to balance with, the, with these publications, balance innovation with um, sustainability and preservability. Um, so we're trying to mitigate as much as possible upstream while these projects are being developed by the authors um, to try and get them to think about what they're producing in terms of its future accessibility. Um, so while we can make certain guidelines and recommendations um, and requirements, which we do, we also want to leave the door open for uh, innovation and use of uh, technology that is, that's, that's new and exciting. So to that end, we end up having to preserve uh, use the tools that we have now to preserve what exists. So um, we want to preserve the interactive experience as part of the argument. So we're, uh, we're exploring further into like web archiving and emulation, um, even while we're also just preserving the bits in a digital repository. And um, we also want though to preserve the underlying code for future researchers um, who specifically value that um, as part of the materiality of of the research that's being presented. So that's where emulation in some ways offers some advantages over web archiving in the sense that we can capture all of those moving parts um, and all of the dependencies um, while we're also presenting the content in a high fidelity um, representation. So, so that's kind of what, what we're trying to preserve, what we're trying to do. Um, and the easy environment is providing one possible solution. Um, so we've been testing it in hopes that we can preserve that underlying code, but also um, provide researchers access to um, an, the interactive um, publication itself. So there are different ways to approach like importing an environment or creating an environment in the easy uh, interface. And what we've seen so far is um, a little bit different from the approach that I took on this. So I should say that um, our testing at the press with Easy it is very much a work in progress. Um, so what I'll be showing here now is just a walkthrough of what we've done so far. And there are a lot of other ways to do this, um, other ways to do this even in Easy. So I first, for this project, created um, created the environment in VirtualBox. Um, and so there were a few reasons for that. Um, really, I did it, I created this environment um, before I even started thinking about emulation. So I had done this as an exercise for something completely different. Um, but once I saw that um, you could actually import a VDI, a virtual disk image, into Easy, um, I figured I have this, so why not try it this way? Um, it also, though, seems like as I went through that process, I, I could identify some reasons why maybe this would be a good approach for this type of content as well. Um, and that's because there are a lot of components in the stack. Um, there's, um, I mean, in a, in a LAMP setting, I mean, you have to have all of these different configurations as well. So um, I wanted to load up uh, software and systems that were not necessarily older systems, but newer systems, um, newer open source, like uh, Linux distributions or things like that. So um, building that environment, configuring it, it, configuring it with all of the security um, settings and everything like that was a process in itself that just seems to go more quickly, um, building it in VirtualBox and then later just importing that whole thing over to Easy. Um, let's see. I mean, I'll just go ahead and like let this run. It probably won't finish, but this is uh, this is the um, this is the virtual box. Uh, just a screencast from what what the publication looks like in virtual box. So if you compare this to what you saw just a few minutes ago with the live web version, 
Um, it looks pretty similar. There are some glitches. You can see like at the bottom, the, the bottom menu um, where it says tutorial. Uh, there should be other options there, um, but it is showing that JavaScript tutorial at the um, kind of overlay at the beginning. And then um, as it goes through, you'll see that it has a lot of the same features that the, the original version had. And I wonder if I can speed it along. There you go. So you can kind of see the, um, the visual complexity with how the content is organized. Um, the key here though, I should mention, <laughs> it's very important, is that the videos themselves live in Vimeo. So they are external web content. Um, so on the live web, of course, that API brings those videos in seamlessly. Um, a reader doesn't even necessarily know they're coming from somewhere else. But once we import it into a self-contained environment um, that no longer has access to the Vimeo material, then obviously that very important resource and very important part of the publication is no longer part of the publication. So there are some possible workarounds for this. Um, we have the video content available just as their raw files, and those are things that um, as a package, we could load into the virtualized environment, um, but that would still be removing that content from the context. So as someone was browsing the publication, they may then still have to use cues um, from the URL perhaps um, to locate that video in a separate, um, a separate folder that's installed on the, on the hard drive. Uh, all right. So once this was created, though, in the VirtualBox environment, then um, I could import it into Easy. And so this is just a screencast of me doing that. And there are some configuration settings to kind of tweak um, a long wait. That's sped up times 20, <laughs> actually, in the screencast. So um, it takes a while to load, of course. Um, but once it is loaded, then it looks much like the use cases that we've seen, um, where the operating system starts up, um, it runs its tasks, and you can see all of that happening. I think I sped all of this up. I should have anyway. Um, you can see that it's running, and it, but it's running pretty slowly. Um, the content files, as I mentioned, would also need to be loaded. Um, which is possible to do to um, to edit an environment once it's once it's imported. Um, but it is then difficult to further refine this environment within the emulator just because it is such a complex stack to go in and kind of change settings. Um, like for instance, I wanted to change uh, I wanted to be able to change like the startup applications so that a browser would actually come up as soon as the system booted up. And then the home page was set to the the home page that I wanted to display the landing page essentially, um, and just that type of thing is just much harder to do once you're actually doing it inside the emulator versus in VirtualBox. Okay, so uh, I'll just skip that. So this is the point that I could get to um, so far with this test run. So importing the environment works, launching the environment, running the environment works, um, getting the site to load, I've had, I've had kind of inconsistent results. So uh, this is as far as I've gotten. It says it's loading. Um, other times uh, before I tried to capture this screencast, I have at least seen those visual, the visual network display, and I can navigate um, the essays. The essays do look a little bit different. They don't have those connecting lines between the the, the linked resources. Um, so I'm still unsure why exactly there are those inconsistencies in this environment um, versus in VirtualBox versus the live web environment. And these are all things that I need to be able to just nail down to improve the functionality of this. Uh, so the challenges, of course, with this particular type of content is that um, any external web content can't be seamlessly um, viewed in its original context. It needs to be ported in separately. Um, LAMP is a complex environment to set up and configure. Um, it's worth asking whether it's maybe just not suitable to this type of um, 
to this tool. So there are other, you know, solutions that are that are more um, that are designed more specifically for web content. Um, what else? So the versions can be an issue too. Like this site runs on um, an older version of PHP that's no longer supported. So if we were to try to bring in other publications to the same environment, then we would have to configure multiple PHP um, versions and what to, I mean, maybe different browsers could use different, just a lot of different configuration situations. So the next steps then um, for, for continued testing with easy at least is to maybe clean up uh, the Linux default program stack. So there's a lot of stuff running in this, um, in this emulation that doesn't necessarily need to be running. So we don't need a calculator. We don't need um, the random programs that are just installed in, you know, the version of Debian that I had loaded. Um, we don't need like the minor Minesweeper or whatever. <laughs> um, I also want to configure uh, auto browser launch on startup. Um, we need to just try this, try importing maybe multiple publications into one, um, one emulation. And then more generally though, I think that we want to continue exploring alternative archiving options. So, and maybe there's some overlap too between the affordances of emulation and the, um, the potentials with like web archiving um, and just, just other, other solutions that we've been exploring. So um, I want to, while we still have a little bit of time, hand this off to Ilya. Um, I think he has some things to add here about the work that um, he's doing with us for web archiving. So let me unshare. Hi, thanks, Jasmine. Yes, uh, so I wanted to kind of pick that up and kind of sh uh, talk a little bit about the work that I'm doing, and I'll, I'll share my screen as well. Uh, and so uh, what, what I'm actually working on uh, is uh, kind of a an environment system or essentially a web first emulation system that uh, specifically targets websites uh, and combines web archives and and uh, server preservation with that. And, and so um, here's just a quick demo of Filming Revolution running uh, in the system in, in one of the many modes that it has. Uh, so this is, it's using Chrome 76 uh, and we start directly with the browser. Um, you could also, uh, so you could browse in this remote browser that I have um, and of course, the the key of this is that all of the all of the video content is part of the system, uh, which is necessary to interact with it. Um, and so right now, it's ru it's running in in another browser inside of my browser, and so there might be a little bit of lag in loading it. Um, it's also available um, in in the na in my native browser as well in in this mode, so that this should actually load a little bit faster. Um, and again, all of the all of the animations are are here, um, and uh, uh, kind of uh, talk about a little bit why why I'm taking this approach and what I'm doing. Um, put together like a few a few a few quick notes here. So uh, I think a, a key question is sort of what is at risk exactly? And um, when it comes to a website, there's a server component, and then there's the the actual interaction that happens in the web browser. And so in the case of the server, um, it's using a standard LAMP stack, uh, as Jasmine mentioned. Uh, she, um, but actually the, uh, the LAMP stack is, uh, although it took some time to, to set it up in, in easy, it's actually a very, very common, very standard uh, piece of software. I mean, it's, it's easily deployed in cloud services. It's easily containerized. Um, it's not legacy, um, like some of the other software that, that that we've seen, it's not some software from the '90s. It's it's actually something that's currently available with today's technology. Um, and so the server component, which is what uh, Jasmine was was able to to put into Easy, is uh, the, the total of that is about 40 megabytes. The web archive component, also all of the videos, all the interviews in this piece, um, there's about 450 videos. They're all loaded from Vimeo. So the size of those is about 15, 16 gigabytes. There, there may be some, some duplicates uh, included. Um, and Vimeo sometimes serves them in, in different formats. Uh, the videos can be deleted from Vimeo at any time. Uh, and yeah, so, so essentially 
I would even say that the preserving the server component here is the easy part. The hard part of the site uh, and sort of what makes it valuable is what the user ac actually sees in the browser, which is the which unfortunately can only be captured with the web archive because we don't have access to Vimeo servers. We can't get that data from Vimeo. Um, so it's possible to overlay the 1516 gigabyte web archive with the uh, kind of preserved server component. Um, and just kind of a little bit of, of what I'm working on. Um, the first part of it is the automatic containerization preservation of the LAMP stack. Um, sort of the hard part that that uh, Jasmine was working on. I actually see that as sort of the easier part in some ways because the LAMP stack is a standardized, uh, it, it's, you know, the, obviously the, there are variations, but it's it's something that's definitely doable because it's widespread uh, software that's in today's, uh, in, in use today. And so we could automatically have a workflow that takes the LAMP stack, puts it into, say a Docker container uh, or, you know, deploy it and makes it easily deployable in the cloud or in another system. The hard part though is actually then determining what the, what needs to be crawled. So in the case of, of this site, uh, there's about 450, 460 Vimeo videos that I had to extract from a database. Uh, doing that automatically is, is sort of the tricky part. And uh, then also of course, scaling crawling infrastructure to be able to crawl the, all those videos uh, in a particular format. Um, and then finally is, is just having a, a system that launches, uh, essentially launches the web archive overlaid with the, with the server. And so that's kind of what, it, what, it, what I've demoed here is uh, basically uh, the system is, is uh, oh, we'll go to this, uh, that, so it's, it's actually uh, a web archive, most of the, so the bulk of the, the 15 gigabytes of data is coming from the web archive, only a small percentage is coming from that preserved server. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm the, the only person working on this right now is me. <laughs> so it's moving, it's moving along. Um, and uh, so, some other considerations, uh, and it would probably don't have much time is, uh, it's also preserving a, a browser, in this case, Chrome 76, um, and there are some trade-offs there. Uh, if you're using the, the preserved browser, you have access to something like Flash. However, for a, a video and animation heavy site, um, like Filming Revolution, just using the, the user's native browser whenever possible uh, makes the most sense to have the best experience. Um, and this is also kind of where this differs from, from Easy a little bit because Easy brings emulation to the web, but when it comes to websites and web servers, they're all, by definition, are already on the web. Uh, so we don't necessarily need to emulate that uh, unless there's a specific technology like Flash. Um, and again, it, all of this is dependent. Um, and uh, I can share this later, uh, but yeah, this is really dependent on websites, how much of a website is uh, coming from external sources, what are the technology dependencies, is, is all of it hosted on on your own site or on Vimeo, for example. Um, so it, it really depends on on the exact infrastructure of the site. And we really could use more methodology on how to even determine that. Um, so for example, a site with primarily video-based based content, a web archive is really the only way to go. But if it's a, a custom web server that doesn't use Vimeo, then maybe uh, a simple server preservation may be sufficient. Although most sites will probably require a combination of both to have to have uh, the full preservation and, and, and complete user experience as intended. Um, so uh, yeah, that's it for me. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over back to, back to Jasmine. Yeah, thank you, Ilya. Um, so we're, we're working with Ilya through the rest of this year as part of the part of our grant um, at the press um, to really focus on how how we're going to extend the life of these web publications um, and extend the um, just the availability of them um, as part of the scholarly record. So thank you for for helping us out there. Um, and now I will give it back 